Hi guys, Eric Pappy here, back with another review, back from Las Vegas, and I wanted to talk about how I analyze jazz albums and what's my criteria. I love comparing and doing shootouts of vinyl, and that's one of the things I love about the hobby versus just streaming it. I'm not going to compare shootouts of streaming. So I wanted to talk about this album because I happen to have one in one step over here with the hard box, portrait in jazz, and then I have the Riverside recording, which is part of a box set, which is this behemoth right here from Chad, which when originally came out was limited, and I snapped it up for $900 because I wanted to make sure I got it. I did a video review on this before. Unfortunately, I believe I deleted it by accident, unlike the iPhone, which I'm recording this video on, the old one. Um, you, there's no junk bin. You delete on YouTube, it's gone forever. So this has, not to mention Portrait and Jazz, it has At Shelley's, How My Heart Sings, Cannonball, Waltz for Debbie, Mood Memes, Explorations, Everybody Digs, Bill Evans, New Jazz Conceptions, of course, Interplay, and Sunday at the Village Vanguard. So what's amazing about that is the one step on the Village Vanguard goes for seven to $900 in the used market. This whole entire set is 900. They're all 45 on one step, and they're 45 on this. I cannot believe this is still available, brand new sealed at Acoustic Sounds. So what's my criteria I use when I compare jazz albums? How is the main instrument supported by the supporting cast? So what do I mean by that? If it's Davis, trumpet. If it's Coltrane, saxophone. If it's Mingus, upright bass. If it's Bill, obviously piano. I'm less interested in the main instrument of the artist. I want to hear how the artist is supported. This is my core issue when I'm listening to a recording, how I defer, define if it's good or it's bad versus the other recording. In their own rights, they're all good because you can't compare the difference. So when I fall in love, which is the second track after Witchcraft on the second side of the first album, because they're both 45, it's both a double album. If you know that song, the beginning has an amazing guitar, guitar rhythm, and not, excuse me, piano rhythm, if you can say that piano rhythm. Um, and what I find is on this recording, it's obnoxious. So what I mean by that is he strikes the key, he plays his melody, not rhythm, melody, he plays his melody, and it's in your face, and it can almost be fatiguing, because the, uh, the song is like over four minutes. So, the song is four minutes and 50 seconds, it's almost a five minute song. So what I noticed is, when I'm listening to that song on the one step, Scott LaFaro on bass is muffled and muddled and muddy. Paul Motion on drums is in the background. Same thing, muffled and muddy. You can hear them, and again, if you're not comparing it, all you hear is this piano in your face. And if you're listening to Bill for piano, obviously it's gonna sound good. But this kicks its ass because what you hear is equal separation as the band is playing together. You can hear the bass as he's plucking the bass. You can hear the drum, especially when he's hitting his cymbals real light with the feather. And you can hear the separation between all three of them in the trio, but you can't hear that on this. Again, this sounds good if it's all about the piano at the cost of the bass and at the cost of the drums. This is what I don't like in a lot of these jazz recordings. I've heard recordings with Mingus where it's the same thing, it's all the bass, the upright, you don't hear anybody else supporting. When I say you don't hear it, you hear them, but it's not as, as a team. They're, it's like if you're reading something and you take a highlighter. They're highlighting the main instrument. You may say as well they should. They should highlight the sax from Coltrane. They should highlight the trumpet from Miles. They should highlight the drums from Bill. They should hi highlight the upright from Mingus. I don't agree with that. That's just me. That's just me. So with that being said, this set kicks 
the one steps s in this and i'm sure it probably does in the village vanguard so if you're someone considering purchasing the village vanguard on the used market on the one step versus going and buying the brand new set sealed at acoustic sounds this wins hands down all day long you get all those albums in one box instead of one album in one box now i want to move on to the next thing i just got done watching a 43 minute video at jay's audio lab great video with the shootout with the wire with the cables a lot of people ask me about my cable journey the answer is my cable journey was again a fluke thing not didn't have the money in the beginning when i got in the hobby to have high and crazy cables so I did what I could do and got the best of what I could afford. And then 10 years ago, I had to move from one house into an apartment while I was moving into another house. And when I did that, the system went into storage and I became a HeadFi freak, especially stack speakers, stacks electrostatics with their tube amps, which we're gonna to get to at the end of this video. And then I migrated to the Audazy LCDs and the Audazy line and separate amps and the whole head fine insanity because I was in an apartment and I couldn't just get what I wanted holographically with a little system in the apartment. So I started researching and I found a guy, Brian, who owns Zion Sonics. This is an unsolicited testimonial because he doesn't even know I'm doing this video. Z-Y-N-S-O-N-I-X. He happened to be in Baltimore, Maryland, but he was getting good reviews on the forums. So here I am, just like Dr. Vinyl, geography, geography, geography. I called him up once I moved and I said, can you make me a pair of interconnects? Sure, how long? Can you make me a pair of speaker cable? Sure, how long? So he, the guy's a mad scientist. He's been in the business 15 years. Don't ask me about whether it's copper or it's silver, because I don't know. I just gave, let him come over and listen to the speakers. He decided what would be best. These are the interconnects coming from the back of the DS Audio into the preamp, because I like to keep my turntable far away from everything else, and especially I don't like the turntable in between speakers. As you can see, I don't like a system in between speakers. It's not my thing. I like the system to be on the side and the speakers to be in the middle. So I've been using Zion Sonics products for literally 15 years, and I'm not somebody that buys cables and ABs them. Now I understand a lot of the allure of the cables, and look, I have two of my friend, my business partner and one of my friends, who I did a video of his site. These guys, they got all the high-end big snake cables. I get it. They can hear the differences. I get it. I just have to stop the madness somehow, some way. So I choose to be happy with the cables that I have, knowing that I could probably make changes and they would sound better. But what is the biggest change that I hear in sonically in my system to change the system? And what is a little tweak that you can do instead of rolling cables, buying a set and then having all the, a, a drawer of cables or a box of cables? Here's the, here's the simple, easy recipe to get different flavors out of your stereo system at minimal cost, regardless of the price of the system. Taught by my 85 year old audiophile father when I was a kid who was all about the blue meters and Mac. He said, you have solid state amps, you have a preamp that's tube and you roll the tubes. I've been doing that ever since. I have the Macintosh amplifiers. I have a Backert Lab Rumba made in Delaware. And then what do I do? If I want sonic changes, I roll the tubes. It's the least space-wise, economical way-wise, because I don't have thousands of different cables sitting in drawers, and I can just buy cables, iron uh, tubes. Ironically, I'll get recommendations for different tubes depending upon the sound that I want. And I usually am disappointed with my purchases. I have one set in there that just have been the best I don't even, I, I don't take them out. I can't remember the name, they might be Telefunken. But I got the gold lines right here. I got the RCAs right here. And um, I'm running in this, in this, um, in this preamp just two tubes. But I tell you, man, tubes make a difference. Now this is gonna be very confrontational to a lot of people. Placebo, 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 not with the speaker cable. I would argue the amplifiers. 
I would say there's too much hyperbole, hyperbole on the amplifiers themselves versus the preamp. People will put new amps into their system and say, oh my God, can you hear that? It's bullshit. I'm telling you, my ears, to me, it's bullshit. I don't, I, I'm not a good listener and describer of different amplifiers. Preamps, one second. DAX, one second. Styluses, two seconds. So if you're a guy that likes to tweak, tweak on your preamp. Get a tube preamp, and I'll leave you with three words. Roll, baby, roll. Good day and good luck.